Today, uh, we are starting our fifth week um, in our six-week sermon series uh, entitled Back to the Basics. Um, And for those of you that may be new uh, or may have missed a few, um, just to recap, um, we're going over the basics of what the church is meant to be. Okay, Paul is writing this letter to his apprentice, Timothy. Um, Paul had left Timothy behind in Ephesus to continue to work and do ministry um, and grow the church that was in Ephesus. Um, And it's always a great idea uh, for us to take some time and and look back and remember the how-tos, the basics of things, right? It's always good to go back once in a while and and look at that stuff. especially when it comes to ministry, because God had designed it with all of us in mind and for a purpose. So why wouldn't we make sure we're following it and doing it the way he would want? So um, hopefully today we can gather a little bit um, from this and get a little bit from this and bring it into our own church and make sure that we're continuing to follow God's purpose for our ministry um, here at Calvary Church. So With that being said, can we pray into this time of the sermon? Let us pray. Great Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for today. Help us to take any distractions that we may have in our lives and and, and cast them far off, Lord. Let us focus just for this time, this small amount of time on you. Let us keep you at the center uh, uh, of our day and our, our life and our mission, Lord. Help us to trust that in all ways, you have what's best for us in your heart. Help us to trust that, that, that we can follow you and know that we are doing your work. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, before we get too far into it, I want to make sure that we're awake and ready. Okay? So today, I'm not going to just ask a question that you get to sit there and because some of you, when you're doing this, are actually doing this. And it's just not actually a yes. Okay? So we're going to make sure that everybody is lively and ready to go, and it has to be an audible answer. Okay? Can we handle that? I got three yeses. Can we handle that? Thank you. All right. Um, so I want you to know before we get too far, there's not a wrong answer. You are not going to fail this test, all right? Um, There could be many different reasons, all right, or many different opinions. Um, How many people here have ever referred to this church or any other church they've gone to as the people in it being their church family? You can raise your hands for that one. That one you don't actually have to nod. Okay. All right, so most of us, the majority probably, right, um, have done that at some point or not. Um, does anybody, this is where it comes in to be audible, does anybody feel comfortable sharing why they referred to a church as their church family? (laughs) What was it? Huh? Love. Love. Okay. Donna? Death of a family member. Okay. It's our village helping raise our kids. We got a lot of sleepers today. Yeah. What? A lot of the same way of thinking. Okay. Thought I saw another hand go up too. Yes. Because we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how you know she's a PK. <laughs> Preacher's kid. There we go. <laughs> Cheating on the test. No. Uh, <laughs> no, awesome. Again, none of these are wrong. You don't have to feel like anybody's going to be wrong. There's nothing that says just this reason is the reason we're a church family. Okay? There's a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of different reasons we could call each other that. and um, Sometimes we sugarcoat it, maybe because it's around here, but it's pretty simple. Um, you see... There's so many different answers, and all of them are right because of this. 
It's as simple as we come here to worship God. And like she said, she cheated on that. She, she read this sermon. We were brothers and sisters in Christ, right? If nothing else, that would be the case. Then is this our only church family? Then The people that are here? Okay. Um, so uh, we are 100% true. And, and some of it is some people call it church family because uh, there's people that are raised up in a church from the time they were little all the way until they become adults, right? And you remember seeing them as a little kid, and now they're, they're older, and you're like, man, this is family because they did have a hand in raising you. They, maybe they were your Sunday school teacher. Maybe they were your, uh, uh, there for um, the day you got baptized. Maybe they were there uh, when you got married. May, all these different life events that are huge tend to be around a church. And so you get to know these people. Sometimes it's the amazing things like that. But sometimes it's like Donna said, you're around them when they lose somebody. They tell you, you want to find out who loves you and who's there for you. Don't look when the celebrations go and see what happens when the fire starts. Because when stuff gets hard, you find out who's there, right? You found out who's not going to run away. Hopefully not too many of us refer to the church as our family because we fight with each other like brothers and sisters. Hopefully not too, although we do sometimes, right? We do. It happens, Okay. Some of us like the right and wrong sports teams. Not going to mention any because I'm on the wrong end this year. <laughs> Sometimes it's over more serious stuff, like decisions that have to be made or, or a decision that is made that somebody doesn't like. Whatever it may be, hopefully that's not why we call them family. But it's, we call them family because we come back from those fights and still love one another. There's a difference, right? If you fight with a stranger on the street, you may never have to see him again. But are you going to skip your family reunion because there's one cousin you don't like? Are you going to avoid this one thing because oh, I don't want to be with this member I don't get along with? If we're truly family, we get through those things because family is both a blessing and sometimes a curse right if you have your bibles go ahead uh open them up to timothy chapter five we're going to be reading verse one um through three first thing um first this morning um and, and paul is right about some of the these issues um with the church is writing about some of these issues with the church that we still deal with today um, and we probably will forever. But if we're paying attention to them, maybe we can be a better church family. So let's read. This one's the, the first part's entitled Widows, Elders, and Slaves. Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him as if he were your father. And treat younger men as your brothers. Older women as your mothers and younger sister, or younger women as your sisters with absolute purity. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. Now we're going to put some of this into context to make sure we understand um, fully before we go too far into it. Um, at the time, you got to remember at this time, uh, um, after a certain age, uh, you probably became... In the eyes of this community, kind of a, more of a burden or useless, right? Because you couldn't work to support anymore. They didn't have Social Security or retirement is what I'm saying, okay? They didn't have that. And, and let's be real. In your 50s is probably what your 90s was back then, okay? We, we didn't have the healthcare system. We didn't have the, the safeties that we have that we do now, right? We didn't have the stuff in place that we lived as long. Um, so, uh, they, they had, Paul had to make sure, hey, just because they can't do what they used to do doesn't mean that they're less important or that you shouldn't still give them the respect they deserve. Okay? Because there are lessons 
that we could miss if we take the older generation for granted. If we take a generation, and it doesn't matter which, it could be one, 10 years older than you, it could be two, 20 years older than you, whatever it may be. There may be, a lo- well, not maybe, there are a lot of things we can take from them if they are willing to share it with us. And one of the things that I remember being taught all the time um, by one of my history teachers is actually what made me fall in love with history is those who don't learn history are what? Bound to repeat it. So why wouldn't we listen to them and uh, to to people older than us and learn from the things they did right and how they did it and how they, they were successful in it and the amazing things they accomplished? And also in the same degree, why not learn from their failures so we don't do the same thing? Because they've learned lessons that maybe we won't have to. I mean, don't you wish, you, you, those of you that have had kids, don't you wish they would have just trusted you and not touched the stove? Why? Why does everybody have to learn that on their own? We're stubborn. But the sad thing is that carries over into our life. How many mistakes? I mean, I can think even from when I was a kid, if I would have just listened to my mom or my brother or my friends and, and just not done something stupid, life would have been easier or safer. Okay, if I would have just been like, hey, maybe you listen to this guy and, 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 or this girl and, and you listen and grow and make sure you don't hit the same potholes. Doesn't mean we won't make mistakes. But listen. And we take it for granted. Sometimes I joke with people, especially as a football coach, I joke with my athletes all the time because the thing they give me the hardest time about is, is gray, and my kids sometimes, is gray hair. Okay? So I make sure to reference all the time. The Bible says gray hair is a sign of wisdom. Okay? Just saying. We can take things out of context. We want to play this game. We can do it. A little bit more wisdom than some of you. A lot of you? Nope. But did I get the gray hair because I became wise? No. I got the gray hair probably because of the stupid things I did. Or the stupid things my kids did. <laughs> whatever it may be, okay? They're earned. And the reason the, the scriptures actually say that if we go into it is because that's saying, hey, they probably lived more life than you. So they probably could teach you a thing or two. They could probably tell you how to avoid some stupid things. Okay? Um, and and it, it's just one of those things that... We need to make sure we're respecting them in the way for all the things they have to teach us if we are willing to learn. But, yes, and we also need to treat them with the same respect we would an older member of our family. Because I don't know about you, but in my family, if you treated an older generation, if you treated your grandma with disrespect or something, whew. Whew, Grandpa was not happy. And Grandpa was old school, spare the rod. Know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Oh, Grandpa's passed. I can say he hit me with the belt. Can I? Because he, yeah, yeah, he, he can't get in trouble no more. He's passed. We're good. <laughs> it, it, it was a different level of authority. Okay? Um, but we have to remember the other, other side of this. Well, because... Well, Paul doesn't let the older generation off the hook, does he? Okay, shoot, in 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says, um, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. It says, it doesn't say, hey, this younger generation, treat them like they're your kids. Is that what he says? No. Treat them like what? Your brothers and sisters. Do you treat your kids the same way you treat your brothers and sisters? I hope not. Because that would be awkward for one or the other. I don't know which. It's more awkward. (laughs) Okay. You treat your brother and sister, yeah, you fight like brothers and sisters, but you probably treat them more like an equal, right? Especially the older you get. That was definitely not the case when I was in high school or college. But the older we get, they're more equal. 
don't treat them like, hey, you, you're just a little kid. We have to treat them as what we should be treating them as is your little brother, sister, to treat them, to raise them, and be their mentor. To be the ones that are willing to share that without being judgmental if they end up deciding, well, the way you did it and this time didn't may not work exactly the same this time, but I get what you're saying and let's do this. Because remember, you catch more flies with what? Yeah. And I get it's easy because some of the, I, I see your frustration as I'm teaching freshmen now. Okay, I say I do. It, it's tough sometimes. <laughs> it's tough to relate at times, the generational gap. But you got, we have to work to make sure we learn from you and learn to help grow this church for the next 75 years. So many churches and businesses, you know what their ultimate pitfall is? Second generation. And if it's not second, their biggest fall off is the third. Why? Any guesses? Audible, please. They're lazy? Okay. That's part of it. Lazy is the common answer. Okay. You notice who all the answers are coming from. And all of them have to do with what? Technology or being lazy. So is that the truth? Or is that just what we interpret because of the generation difference? Because usually the reason, main reason is, is because the older generation of a business struggles to let go and let the new generation run it differently. And that struggle blows it up. Same thing happens in a church all the time. The older generation's like, well, we want all of them here to do it while we do it. And the younger generation's like, no, we don't have anything we can learn from you. We're going to just take it over and do it our way. You're both wrong. You have to work together. The successful businesses realize there is value in what you're saying, but there's value in what I know too. And they work together to merge. But both sides have to become less hard-headed. Because it does work, otherwise we wouldn't have long-standing companies, right? So we have to wor learn to to work that out and learn to do that. One of the things that is a good, great example is that is, and, and I didn't even think of this until Deb said they're always on their phone. One of the ways that, that the new generation is, is better at is old school marketing. What, what was the way you did it? You did billboards, you did whatever, you did that kind of stuff, okay? How many older generation love social media? Oh, a lot of you, all right, okay? You know the number one way people see your church and see your businesses anymore? Social media. Okay? They are paying people hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars to come run social media for companies. Okay? Uh, I mean, I guarantee they invest more in that. Um, I mean, if we went to Alcoa, Deer, um, and those companies, I bet if we looked into it, they probably advertise more in social media now than they do on radio or TV because it's better marketing. It's just learning to bridge the gap. Okay? Uh, thank you. I did not think that would work so easily, so thank you for that. Second part, Timothy 5, um, 19 through 22. Don't accept an accusation made against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Discipline those who are sinning in front of everyone so that they will, uh, 
They will all be afraid. Don't freak out. We're going to explain that. I charge you before God and Christ Jesus and elect, uh, elect angels to follow these practices without bias and without playing favorites. Don't rush to commission anyone to leadership and don't participate in sins of others. Keep yourself morally pure. It's the word of God for us, the people of God. Let's speak to God. Oh, I have more scripture later, but that's okay. Um, the next path is a key. Uh, so many churches don't necessarily follow. Okay? We talked about this a few weeks ago. One of the biggest problems that churches tend to have is what? Starts with a G. Gossip. Thank you. I can't believe you came up with that. Great job. You're paying attention. Um, gossip, right? We have the gossip mill, okay? It is, uh, unfortunately, a very common thing within churches. Um, and it also is the thing that tends to kill churches because 90% of this um, that happens, 90% um, of these disagreements, what they should be doing is going straight to the person rather than triangulation, okay? Triangulation kills companies. It kills churches. You can't do those kind of things because when you do, it makes people pick sides like you're a junior high kid. Anybody remember that? It, maybe it was a small school thing, okay? We had like 20 kids in our class. If two girls got in a fight, we had to pick which girl we were friends with. And we had 10 kids on one side, 10 two, and you can't be friends with each other. It's like real life, whatever, reality TV. Before it was reality TV, it was so dumb. So dumb. But we do that in a church. We laugh at it with junior high kids, but we act like junior high kids sometimes, don't we? Yeah, we do. Um, and it says to call, the, when people are going and doing this, to call them out. It's not meaning literally like here and bring somebody up. Hey, hey, all right, come up. You've been a jerk. Let's talk this out. And I'm going to call you out in front of all these people and tell them what you did. No. It's talking about if somebody's being a bully and a jerk, you need to bring them before church leadership if you went and talked to them and had a conversation. And then if you went with a friend and had a conversation or, or, or a leadership of the church and it still didn't change anything. And then the next step is going to church leadership. Okay? You don't go and parade somebody in front of the church. That's not what it's saying. It's just describing this situation because even in Paul's time, people like to act like junior high kids sometimes okay that's not what we mean by let's all try and be youthful at heart is let's be gossips and jerks to each other <laughs> that's not what we mean right um but the last part does say uh, another factor as well which is another common problem that we we we, uh, we tend to see is we rush people into leadership within the church now that never used to be a problem and in, in the American church, the way it is now. The problem existed differently, I should say. The problem back in the day was, oh, well, I just met a friend, and since I trust this friend, um, tomorrow that friend's becoming associate pastor of the church. We just met a week ago, but now they're associate pastor, okay? That's what it's talking about at that time. What it's talking about now, or how it relates to us now, is the fact that, okay, um, so it, it's uh, um, Joe's first week at the church. He just came and visited this time. Hey, Joe, now you're going to be on trustees. You're going to be on finance, and you're going to lead three different Bible studies, okay? Good to go. Um, we do that. We do, but why? Do we do it out of a bad place? No. We do it out of, A, we think we're helping and connecting people, right? But we're not yet. The reason it's happening is because we've talked about this before. We're missing a group. We're missing the 50 to 60s. Now, yes, there's some of you that are between 50 and 60, but what is the smallest age group in our church? 50 to 60s. Okay? <laughs> but it's the group that's not here. Okay? Um, and so... Who would be people that are in their 70s and 80s? What group would you normally be passing off leadership to? 50s and 60s. So you don't have anybody. So we now we, we have a 
30 and 40 year old that's coming through the door the first time. It's like, oh, finally, I've been serving 10 more years than I'm supposed to have to. <laughs> I got somebody. We got to give them time. Give them time. They, they don't need to be in leadership next week. <laughs> okay. We got to learn them first. You got to teach them, the, again, the pitfalls, the things not to do, the things you do well. Okay. We got to raise up leaders because that generation's not here to take over. So that means some people are going to have to probably eventually step up younger than what we used to. And some people are going to have to stay longer than what we used to. But if we're doing it for the right reasons, if we're doing it for the kingdom of God, it'll be worthwhile. Correct? If we're doing it so that we see another generation of this church, if we see another 75 years, it'll be worth it. But we must take that time. Okay. Honestly, most of these things probably seem rather simple. Okay. That it's, hey, we can do this. Take care of your church if we simplify it. Take care of your church and take care of your church family. Family doesn't sound like it should be that difficult, right? Not gossiping, false allegations against people. That stuff shouldn't be that hard. It's pretty, should be pretty easy. But then God calls us to love one another as we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And here's where the caveat comes in and here's where the challenge becomes. Verse 8 says this. But if someone doesn't provide for their family, and especially for a member of their household, they have denied their faith and they are worse than those who have no faith. We don't take care of each other because this is our household. Right? If we don't take care of one another, support one another, then we're not doing what we're called to do. Because we're not stepping out in our faith the way God called. reason he says it's worse than those who don't is because we know the truth. We know what scripture says. We know what God ultimately did for us. He sent his son to die so that we could be free. And we can't love the person that's across the aisle from us. So it becomes our choice, Calvary Church. We know the truth. Now we have to choose if we're going to live it out within these walls and outside as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me as um, they make their way up for our closing hymn? Gracious and Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time to worship together and, and, and listen to your message, Lord. Just help us to trust your words, trust your scriptures, and trust the truth that you have given us. Help us to live it out and love one another and take care of one each, uh, another, even when it's hard. Anybody can run with the, the front of the pack. Help us to help those that can't. Lord, help us to be your light to each other and to the world. Pray all these things in your name. Amen.